Welcome to the Tech Meme Ride Home for February 1st, 2021. I'm Brian McCullough. Today, it's a day ending in AY, so that must mean Google discontinued another flagship product. Microsoft reports that its next growth industry is cybersecurity. Ring has basically doubled the amount of police and fire departments that can request access to your doorbell videos. And what happened when Elon Musk showed up on Clubhouse last night? Here's what you missed today in the world of tech. Google has discontinued the Pixel Slate, which was its first flagship tablet announced all the way back in October 2018. Apparently, now the game plan is to focus on laptops like the Pixelbook Go. That's the plan now. But hey, in six months, I might be reporting how they're discontinuing all Pixelbooks. You never know, quoting 9to5Google. At the start of last month, we reported on how the Pixel Slate was out of stock in the U.S., Canada, and U.K. Inventory did not return in the intervening weeks, and the Google Store today removed the product listing entirely. It's also no longer shown under the main Pixelbook tab. The Pixelbook Pen was also taken down, though replacement tips remain available. Google pushed both entertainment and productivity use cases for its tablet. The latter was aided by an official keyboard case that connected via pins and had round chiclet keys. The USB-C port supported 4K display output for a docked configuration. Design-wise, all units were available in midnight blue, and the device weighed 1.6 pounds for a svelte 7mm thickness. Overall, standalone Chromebook tablets versus convertible 2-in-1s have yet to take off as a form factor. Android apps were the primary appeal, but the experience was lacking, and more optimized experiences were found on the web. Chrome OS tablets will likely have more luck on the low end. Around eight months after the Pixel Slate was announced, Google confirmed that it was moving away from first-party tablets and focusing on laptops, as seen by the Pixelbook Go. The Pixel Slate no longer being available for sale comes as the original Pixelbook met a similar status back in September, end quote. Yeah. You know what I'm going to say here, don't you? Something, something, never trust Google to, well, just let at Red Letter Dave say it for me for the 20th time, quote, you can't get too attached to any Google product, with the exception of Gmail, Maps, maybe. Every other Google product might be on the chopping block at any given time. Google tends to kill just as many products as it unveils, end quote. From the category of They didn't already have this, although I guess not because Mac versus PC, right? But still, how many iPhone users use a PC? Apple has released an iCloud Passwords browser extension for Chrome on Windows. Quoting 9to5Google again, Besides iTunes, Apple's biggest offering on Microsoft's operating system is the iCloud Sync client for files, photos, and mail. Apple is now extending its presence on Windows with an iCloud Passwords Chrome extension. After updating iCloud for Windows to version 12, which teased the extension's existence earlier this week, you'll see a new passwords section in the list of available services. Tapping Apply to proceed at the bottom opens a dialog box to download the tool inside Chrome. It provides access to the passwords that you've created, had automatically generated or saved in Safari for iOS and macOS while using Chrome. The sync is bi-directional with new credentials you store in Google's browser saved to the iCloud keychain so that it's accessible on iPhone, iPad, and Mac devices, end quote. Bunch of trend stories all in a row here. First up, we know that Microsoft has been killing it. As we said, all the big platforms slash oligarchs seem to be killing it these days, with the possible exception of Google, which we'll see tomorrow after the bell when they release their earnings, along with Amazon. But it's not just cloud computing that has Microsoft's revenue and profit numbers soaring, apparently. Get this. For Microsoft, at least, OPSEC is a growing industry. Microsoft has revealed that its various cybersecurity offerings crossed $10 billion in revenue over the last 12 months, up 40% year over year. And actually, that revenue now accounts for around 7% of Microsoft's total revenue for the last fiscal year, quoting Yahoo Finance. 
The $10 billion figure comes from the security-related revenue generated by services including Microsoft's Azure Active Directory, Intune, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, Office 365, Microsoft Cloud App Security, Microsoft Information and Governance, Azure Sentinel, Azure Monitoring, and Azure Information Protection. Each of those makes up what Microsoft calls its Intelligent Cloud and Productivity and Business Processes segments. Those overarching segments generated $14.6 billion and $13.4 billion in revenue, respectively, in the company's fiscal Q2 2021. Quote, what we have built is very helpful in times of crisis, and there is a big crisis right now, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella told Yahoo Finance in an interview on Wednesday. But you need to sort of obviously build all of this over a period of years, if not decades, and then sustain it through not just product innovation, but also, I would say, practice every day, end quote. The announcement follows Microsoft's involvement in uncovering the breadth of the massive SolarWinds cyber attack in December, which hit private companies like cybersecurity firm FireEye and government agencies including the Treasury, Commerce, and State Departments, as well as the National Nuclear Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security. I was most proud that we became the first responders for this attack. Vasu Jakal, Microsoft Corporate Vice President of Security, Compliance, and Identity Marketing, told Yahoo Finance, quote, We were the defenders that other defenders were turning to. We were working with FireEye and across the public sector and private sector coming together saying, What should we do and how should we protect our world against it, she said, end quote. We've been hearing for a while now that Facebook Groups is almost single-handedly keeping the legacy Facebook app alive among certain demographics, folks who otherwise have abandoned using Facebook for various reasons. I mean, just anecdotally, I know my own mother won't give up Facebook because there's a quilting group that she can't live without. But according to the Wall Street Journal, internal research at Facebook itself showed that not only are groups filled with just the sort of stuff that has driven a lot of people away from using Facebook, in fact, groups might be the worst, filled with this sort of garbage the most, quoting the journal. The company's data scientists had warned Facebook executives in August that what they called blatant misinformation and calls to violence were filling the majority of the platform's top civic groups, according to documents the Wall Street Journal reviewed. Those groups are generally dedicated to politics and related issues and collectively reach hundreds of millions of users. The researchers told executives that, quote, enthusiastic calls for violence every day, end quote, filled one 58,000-member group, according to an internal presentation. Another top group claimed it was set up by fans of Donald Trump, but it was actually run by, quote, financially motivated Albanians, end quote, directing a million views daily to fake news stories and other provocative content. Roughly, quote, 70% of the top 100 most active U.S. civic groups are considered non-recommendable for issues such as hate, misinformation, bullying, and harassment, the presentation concluded. Quote, we need to do something to stop these conversations from happening and growing as quickly as they do, the researchers wrote, suggesting measures to slow the growth of groups at least long enough to give Facebook staffers time to address violations. Our existing integrity systems, they wrote, aren't addressing these issues, end quote. In response, Facebook, ahead of the election, banned some of the most prominent problem groups and took steps to reduce the growth of others, according to documents and people familiar with its decisions. Still, Facebook viewed the restrictions as temporary and stopped short of imposing measures some of its own researchers had called for, these people said, end quote. As at Era Inert said on Twitter, quote, For some reason... Everything they focus on ends up amplifying the worst in humanity. First newsfeed, then groups. What should we focus on and probably ruin next? VR, end quote. And as the great John Battelle tweeted, quote, Move fast, break things. Apologize with a side of weak sauce. Move fast and break more things. Repeat, end quote. No matter what stage of life you're in, thinking about your financial future can evoke some pretty strong feelings. But did you know that people who work with a financial advisor feel more at ease about their finances and end up with 15% more money to spend in retirement on average? 
Now, thanks to Smart Asset, the service that over half a million people have trusted to help find an advisor, there's a free and easy path to help you find greater financial peace of mind. Smart Asset has built a safe, easy, and convenient tool to find vetted financial advisors in your area. Here's how it works. Begin by taking Smart Asset's short quiz. The quiz actually clued me into the fact that I'm not quite as diversified as I thought. Kel surprise. And then within minutes, Smart Asset will match you with three pre-screened fiduciaries, each legally obligated to act in your best interest and each willing to do a no-commitment financial consultation. They'll also send you a free personalized retirement planning guide with actionable advice so you can feel confident in your next steps. Take control of your financial future today with Smart Asset. To receive your free personalized retirement planning report, go to smartasset.com slash techmeme. Your report will provide personalized insights on your retirement readiness. So visit smartasset.com slash techmeme today. The Tech Meme Ride Home is sponsored by MetaLab. MetaLab's slogan is, we make interfaces. For over a decade, MetaLab has helped some of the world's top companies and entrepreneurs make products that millions of people use every day. You might not realize it, but you probably used the product MetaLab had a hand in designing today. Things like Slack, Coinbase, Facebook Messenger, Oculus, Uber, and plenty more. In fact, I'm going to be telling you about some of MetaLab's greatest design hits all this week. MetaLab helps everyone from tiny startups to Fortune 500 companies build products that are simple, intuitive, beautiful, and downright delightful. They've launched 205 products and counting, have helped several unicorn companies find blockbuster success, and are known as the best in the design business. MetaLab wants to bring their unique design philosophy to your project. Let them take your brainstorm and turn it into the next billion-dollar company. They can take an idea from something sketched on the back of a napkin to a final shipped product. Check them out at MetaLab.co. That's MetaLab.co. And continuing to keep our eye on how Amazon is creating a friendly neighborhood panopticon with its Ring product, the Financial Times says more than 2,000 police and fire departments in the U.S. have now partnered with Amazon's Ring, with 1,189 new departments added over the past year. So basically doubling their partnership numbers. Quote, All but two of the 50 U.S. states, Montana and Wyoming, now have departments involved with the Ring program, which allows officials to contact users in a particular area and ask them to provide captured footage via Ring's app to assist investigations. In 2020, the departments collectively requested videos related to more than 22,335 incidents. Amazon would not provide a comparative number for 2019, but the data set does show the number of forces working with the Ring platform has jumped since 2018 when just 60 forces were signed up and since 2019 when there were 703 onboarded. Among the most active forces in the country was Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which made 431 requests in the second half of 2020, more than any other force in the country. Public Information Officer Sergeant Efren Conejo noted the high number of homicides in the city and hundreds of shootings. Quote, for a lot of those types of incidents, we are canvassing for video surveillance, he said, end quote. Here's the thing. I don't want a ring doorbell in my life because I don't want Amazon or the police in my house. Fine. But as I walk down my block here in Brooklyn, you can see tons of brownstones, tons of my neighbors with ring doorbells installed. So I don't know if the NYPD has partnered with ring or not, but I'm assuming that I'm being videotaped by my neighbors every time I walk down the street. How do I opt out of that? And I think we've hinted at or talked about in passing a couple of times before that one of the things the pandemic has accelerated is the adoption of augmented reality in automotive and other manufacturing industries, where it is increasingly being used to provide remote assistance to employees in real time, quoting the Wall Street Journal. 
Augmented reality, which superimposes digital content onto a user's view of the real world, became more valuable for some companies such as Mercedes-Benz and L'Oreal last year amid social distancing requirements and lockdowns. The companies are using the technology to provide assistance for employees and consumers in real time without needing to be physically present. Last summer, L'Oreal began using Microsoft's HoloLens 2 headset to help employees install and troubleshoot manufacturing equipment with assistance from experts in different parts of the world. While wearing the HoloLens 2 headset, users can see data instructions and 3D visual images in their real-world view. They can manipulate digital objects by using their fingers to grab the corners of the object and drag it over to one side, among other gestures. With remote assistance software, a user wearing a headset can share their real-time view with others who are using a desktop or mobile device. The worldwide total market value for augmented reality is expected to grow to $140 billion by 2025, up from about $10 billion last year, according to a report this month from tech market advisory firm Allied Business Intelligence. Those figures include hardware, software, and content, AR advertising, platforms and licensing, connectivity, and much more, end quote. Which, that's some serious growth serious market expansion that is happening right now. So apparently for 10 years, there was a bug in sudo, which is used in several versions of Linux, that allowed any local user to gain root access to a Linux system. The bug has now been fixed, but, uh, quoting Bleeping Computer, Sudo is a Unix program that enables system admins to provide limited root privileges to normal users listed in the sudoers file, while at the same time keeping a log of their activity. It works on the principle of least privilege, where the program gives people just enough permissions to get their work done without compromising the system's overall security. When executing commands on a Unix-like OS... Unprivileged users can use the sudo super user do command to execute commands as root if they have permission or know the root user's password. Root is the system super user, a special system administration account. The sudo privilege escalation vulnerability tracked as CVE 2021 3156 was discovered by security researchers from Qualys, who disclosed it on January 13th and made sure that patches were available before going public with their findings. According to researchers, the issue is a heap-based buffer overflow exploitable by any local user, normal users and system users listed in the sudoers file or not, with attackers not being required to know the user's password to successfully exploit the flaw. The buffer overflow allowing any local user to obtain root privileges is triggered by sudo incorrectly unescaping backslashes in the arguments." End quote. And finally today, in case you missed it, Elon Musk was on Clubhouse last night, an event that broke records for the new social network, and also sort of broke it full stop. If you joined late, you couldn't get in. I guess they had to cap the number of people in the room or something. Elon mostly talked about things like space travel, going to Mars, crypto, AI, COVID, vaccines, and the like. Although near the end, Vlad Tenev... CEO of Robinhood came into the room. Quote, did you sell your clients down the river or did you have no choice? End quote. That's my very in the moment paraphrasing slash quoting of what Musk asked Tenev. To which Tenev's reply was basically that, again, I'm paraphrasing here. Robinhood needed to come up with $3 billion in collateral last week, but after they froze some of those volatile stocks, they only had to come up with $700 million in collateral. So, you know, they had to move quickly, did what they had to do. But also, you know, they could have just said that last week. Why they didn't do that and instead chose to really damage their brand, I don't know. Maybe they were afraid that revealing what was really going on would cause a bank run or something. As the great Peter Kafka tweeted, I don't think good PR solves a company's problems because you can't explain slash spin away your problems. But man, does Robinhood need PR help? Transparency slash context is what you're supposed to provide on day one of your crisis, not days later to Elon Musk in a semi-private chat room, end quote. Anyway, a bunch of people live streamed the conversation on YouTube 
if you're interested, I chose one of those at random as the final link in the show notes in case you want to hear how it all went down. By the way, someone who was on stage last night with Elon on Clubhouse was Gary Tan, who often hosts regular Clubhouse events with the likes of Steven Sanofsky and Mark Andreessen. But if you want access to a very intimate and personal conversation with Gary Tan, where we find out how he works and how he sees the world, you're going to want to sign up for Ride Home Plus so you can hear the next Office Hours episode with Gary Tan, which comes out this Friday. Of course, you can sign up at tech.supercast.tech, link at the bottom of the show notes. Weather report, it is snowing to beat the band here in Brooklyn right now. If I can get this out the door soon, going to take the kids to the big sledding hill in Prospect Park. Be on the lookout for some videos posted to Twitter if we're successful. At BrianMCC if you're interested. Talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.